So we're going to cover a couple of different things today. Um, I guess the first caveat is I'm not a virologist. There are lots of people at CDC who spend all of their lives getting to know viruses intimately. I am not one of those people. My background is in public health. So I'm at the prevention end of this process. What we're going to talk about is what is H1N1 and how is it different than seasonal flu? Okay, most of us have had a little bit of experience with seasonal flu. How severe is the illness from H1N1? What precautions should I take? We're going to talk a little bit about things faculty can do. I bet you've heard about the vaccine. And you're kind of wondering, hmm, what's going on with that? So we'll talk about that. We'll do a summary, and then we'll have questions and answers. OK, so we're going to talk about what H1N1 is. And what I've tried to do is to keep this usable. I, I want this to be a usable, usable presentation. As I said, I'm not a virologist. So I'll dip into the science just a little bit. But again, my background is public health education. This is about helping people make changes. OK, H1N1 is also called novel flu. It is a new variant of the flu. And I'll talk in a second about why that's important. Originally called swine flu, and I've got my little piggy there because it's got similarities to a porcine virus. Porcine is pig, of course. Um, it was first detected in people in 2004. Now, the scientific part of this process. What's interesting about H1N1 is that it has four different genetic strains. European pig, Asian poultry, European poultry, and human. And scientists are a little puzzled about that, that peculiar collection of DNA strains in a virus. Does that mean that this is worse or scarier? No. It just means it's kind of a, a difference that we might want to pay attention to, at least if you're a virologist or a, a biological scientist. So we talk a little bit about H1N1 and how it's different than the normal flu. H1N1 has actually got some benefits for older adults. You know, generally, when we have a normal seasonal flu season, what happens is folks at the very, very early part of the life cycle and folks at the very, very late part of the life cycle tend to get the most complications, which means that their death rates are higher. What we're finding with H1N1 is that if you're over 64, you're not at a greater risk for complications. And that's a little bit different than what we normally see in a seasonal flu. We'll also talk about some of the changes that they've seen in disease burden. Disease burden means who gets the disease. What's a little odd about H1N1 is that people under the age of 25 are bearing the largest burden of disease. Now, we're in a college, and so there are actually guidelines specific to institutions of higher education because, well, we tend to have lots of younger people. And we'll talk about that in terms of what faculty can do. Most cells can have an antibody coat. They can have a jacket that helps our immune system go, oh, I know you. You're a friend. Or, hmm, you look pretty suspicious. You're a foe. All this is saying is that younger people don't tend to have a coat that has H1N1 on it. Their bodies don't recognize it, which means for them it is a new phenomenon. What we find with older adults, about a third of older adults do have antibodies to H1N1, which indicates that this virus is in a new form, but we've seen it before. Okay. So 33% of adults over 60 years old have antibodies to the virus. Is there something we need to do about that? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. You just need to know. Because we're not sure if that's going to offer protection for folks who are over 60. We don't know. How severe is illness associated with H1N1? Like seasonal flu, you can have very, very mild cases where you just have that mm, big feeling of malaise. Yeah, you don't quite feel like yourself. And in a few hours or a day or so, it just simply goes away. Or you can have the symptoms that we normally associate with the flu. High fever, body aches. 
Um, interesting thing with H1N1, more people report nausea and, vo and vomiting, which tends not to always go with the flu. Most people who have been sick recover without medical treatment. And we're going to talk about that again when we talk about the stuff faculty can do. As with seasonal flu, hospitalizations and deaths occur. Now, I have a very informed group here. You guys know that every year people die of the flu. But for a lot of the public, part of what's scary about H1N1 is that people have died of it. People die of seasonal flu every year. And in fact, I think I have some stats for you to show you how many. Okay, 5 to 20 percent of the population in the U.S. gets the flu every year. Okay. Um, about 36,000 people die of flu-related complications. People don't technically die of the flu. They die of complications of the flu. Anybody know what the most common complication is? Pneumonia. Yeah. Yeah. Pneumonia is probably the most common complication, especially for older adults. More than 200,000 people are hospitalized from flu-related cases. About 20,000 of them are kids, because you remember we said very, very early in the life cycle, very, very late in the life cycle. And about 120 of them, 100, 120,000, are over 65. And again, early in the life cycle, late in the life cycle. What we find with H1N1 traditionally has been that people who die of H1N1-related complications have other medical problems. Okay? And so and that, that's in keeping with what we normally see. So what can you do? Cover your nose and mouth with a tissue. One of the things that most of us learned when we were little kids, what are you supposed to do when you cough or sneeze in public? Yeah. And you know, it took us a long time to figure out that when you cough into your hands, you now have this nice, moist vector that you can guarantee is going to touch something. In public health, we talk about fomites inanimate objects that can harbor disease, like the backs of chairs, and the papers our students pass to us, and door handles, and telephones. So the new thing is, if you have to cough or sneeze, cough into the crook of your elbow. Because I don't know about you, but I don't spend a lot of time rubbing this against inanimate objects, okay? So if you don't have a tissue, we want to do this, but they're saying, do this. Now, this is a room full of guys, but ladies will tell you, often if the tissue isn't very dirty and you can't find a trash can, you sneeze, you ball up the tissue, and deposit it back in your purse. Now, what we want to do, gentlemen, not in the pockets. Hold it by the edge until you find a trash can and make sure that you throw it away. So if you sneeze, you don't want to sneeze into the same tissue twice, which is why I gave you a packet of tissues. Wash your hands as often as you can with soap and water or alcohol-based cleaners. And I know we did a big thing this year, did a fabulous job of giving out hand sanitizers. This was actually a gift from one of my colleagues. This is a Burt's Bees um, a Witch Hazel hand sanitizer. The main thing you want to think of with hand sanitizers is if you look at the ingredients, you want over 60% alcohol, okay? The thing that you want to remember with your hand sanitizers, is that cleaning our hands sounds pretty easy, but it's actually more difficult than you think. We want to rub our hands together for about 20 seconds. You can hum happy birthday to you in your head, or you can sing it at the tops of your lungs. It's really entirely up to you in your office mitt. You want to make sure that you wash the front surface and the back surface of your hands. I do my wrist as well, and you want to make sure you get in between your fingers. Now, when you talk with adults about hand washing, they just, their eyes roll back. They go, I've been around for a while. I know how to wash my hands. But I challenge you to do the following. For the next week, when you go into the restroom and there's someone else there, look and see how many times other people wash their hands. Data suggests that they don't do it as often as we would like. If you get sick with the flu, stay home. Now, for faculty, that can be really, and for administrators, that can be really, really challenging. If you don't feel well, please, please stay home. Okay, so faculty, 
And again, you have to talk with your division head and your chair to see what's going to work for you. Traditionally, what we do is if students are going to be out, they're going to miss an exam, they're going to miss a major project, what we ask them to do is bring a doctor's note. But a few slides back, what we learned is that lots of people can develop H1N1 and recover without ever going into the healthcare system. So we may want to be a little more flexible about allowing students to take the time they need. Um, so we might want to look at our absence policy. Um, we also might want to provide additional assignments. We really want to encourage students. I think every faculty member here, every administrator, everybody who interacts with students has had this happen. <coughs> <laughs> Professor, <coughs> I'm sick. <coughs> Thank you. Now you're sick, so am I, and the front half of the class. So if it's possible, encourage students. If you don't feel well, please don't come to class. All right, encourage good hand hygiene and model good hand hygiene. So what can you do today? Maintain good health. When your immune system is working well, you can fight off lots of the bad nasties that we all come in contact with. If you're on prescribed medication, please take it because that also helps your body maintain homeostasis or balance. Practice good hand hygiene. Get vaccinated today. There are actually seasonal flu vaccines available right here today on the St. Francis campus, so you don't have to go and make an appointment. And don't forget to enter the raffle. If you have two or more health services done today, you could enter a raffle for a $100 Amex card. I want to talk just a little bit about some of the concerns people have about folks dying. Um, again, what we find is the people who have died from H1N1 complications had other health conditions. They were in high-risk groups. High-risk groups, people over 65, um, children under the age of five, people who are women who are pregnant, people with chronic health conditions, cardiovascular disease, cancer, asthma, all of those diseases make you more susceptible to H1N1. And again, you see 70% of the people who got very ill or died, died of, uh, were a high risk. Um, there are some medicines that can help. So even if for some reason you don't get the vaccine, there's uh, Tamiflu and Relenza have both been approved by the Food and Drug Administration for treatment of H1N1. What this means though, you can't wait until the fourth day you're sick. What they see is that it is most effective if you take it with as soon as you develop symptoms. Okay? Um, one is an aerosol, the other one I believe is an oral medication. You take it for multiple days. But what it can do is it can either prevent you from developing flu symptoms at all, especially if you do it early, or it can lessen the time you feel ill. Okay? And for those of us who uh, need to get back into the classroom or need to get back to work, that's pretty important. Um, a couple things that folks sometimes are a little challenged by, is it a cold or is it the flu? And generally there's some um, hallmark symptoms that you want to be aware of. Very rarely does a cold cause a fever. And depending upon which medical book you read, I generally say if your temperature is 101, certainly you have a fever. And so you want to make sure that you're saying, yeah, okay, I've got a fever, um, I've got some body aches. Headache and fever tend to be the two cardinal signs that distinguish the flu from a cold. Um, the flu tends not to give you upper respiratory symptoms, the coughing, the wheezing types of things, if you don't have asthma. Um, prevention is the best defense against H1N1. Wash your hands, wash your hands wash your hands. We can send a person to the moon. We can explore Mars. We can do open heart surgery on a neonate in the womb. But in the final analysis, one of the best things we can do is to simply keep our hands clean. Okay? Try not to be in close contact with the ill. Now I keep teasing my students that if I come at them with a bottle of Lysol, <laughs> Um, if students are ill, I mean, it's perfectly appropriate to say, you obviously don't feel well. Why don't you go home until you feel better? 
instead of coming to my office hours and closing the door and telling me that you don't feel well. So try to stay away from folks who are ill, which means that if you don't feel well, you stay at home. Um, vaccination. Um, the H1N1 vaccine is in production. What they're recommending for folks is to go ahead and do the seasonal flu vaccine, which is available now, and then do H1N1 when it becomes available. Please go to your doctor if you're high risk, and you know if you are. Okay, please go ahead and do that. Make sure that you keep your immune system as strong as possible. Getting enough sleep, eating well, not being too stressed out. All of those things can relate and, and interact with your immune function. Um, if you become ill, stay home for at least 24 hours after your fever subsides. Fever subsides means you don't have any fever with no medication. So lots of people say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm taking a bunch of drugs and my fever's finally down. You still have a fever. You need to stay home. I really appreciate your time and attention. Oh, certainly, I'm off to give an exam. <laughs>